Welcome to the Startup Sessions, the number one web show and podcast for trusting your gut, breaking the rules, and starting something meaningful. Featuring in-depth interviews with acclaimed creative entrepreneurs that have succeeded at building their own remarkable businesses. This week, I'm speaking with a master connector and storyteller, an amazing entrepreneur, and a truly wonderful human. I have Meg Warden on the show, and this is part one of a two-part series that is so important to the development of any entrepreneur. Meg has the ability to connect deeply at a level that most people don't, and the ability to connect deeply is one of the most powerful and influential skills that you will ever learn in life and in business, and it's a skill that Meg practices and teaches, and she's really good at it. Meg also shares her story of hope resilience, and reinvention. In this interview, you'll hear how Meg used connection and storytelling to overcome tremendous adversity and reemerge as a masterful writer, speaker, teacher, coach, and communicator. It's all coming your way right now on episode 33 of The Startup Sessions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 33. Today, I'm super, super excited to introduce someone that I met a few weeks ago. Meg Warden is in the house. Welcome, Meg, to the show. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So I would consider, based on the, the, the short conversations that we've had and listening to you on another podcast... And seeing some of the information on your website, I would consider you, I always try to classify someone based on my experience. And my experience of you is that you're a, you're a dynamic um, game changer. You work with people and leaders and entrepreneurs to really help them up level and change their game. And you've done that in your life. Um, you're also a master storyteller. That's part of your expertise. And... I think those two things, do, do you think that's a good representation of, of you in a, in a, uh, well, in a nutshell? I'm delighted to hear it. It's a definitely a flattering <laughs> representation. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I would say, uh, yes, I okay. can do those things. And okay. Do <laughs> All right. Lord, I don't know if I'll, ha I'll be able to take that one on, but <laughs> I, I really, it's, uh, it's an arena that I value highly and enjoy exploring. With Great. Own life and other people. Cool. All right. Well, today my goal with you, Meg, is to have some fun, to really dig into the grit of overcoming obstacles and all that entrepreneurs and just we as humans experience in trying to do that. Also, because you're an expert in this area, finding authority through your story is something that I'd like to dig into today as well. And if we've got a little extra time, what it means to live a life that really feeds your work instead of the other way around. Because I've been in that corporate life where I've been kind of upside down and backwards, and, and now I'm working to adjust that. So that's an interesting topic as well. So let's, we'll, we'll play with all these things and have fun with that today. Does that sound good? Things to talk about. Yeah. Okay, so before we dig in quickly, um, I've given you my perception of what, how, I, how I see you. Let me give a little bit of an introduction um, that's a little more formal, but tells, I think, the real story. Um, so you're a writer, you're a speaker, you're also a coach, you influence entrepreneurs, um, probably people that aren't entrepreneurs as well. and you seem to have, um, or at least you're known for helping people overcome kind of the, the, the stigma and shame of, you know, past stuff, past stories, and helping them mold that into uh, grace and tenacity and really taking your, your business and your life and, and launching that forward because of those stories that we've had in our lives. Um. I was also reading your bio this morning, and I, when I read your bio, I really get, here's someone that really embraces 
the fullness of life. I just love it. And I get from your bio when I read it, when you say you've been a hairstylist and a yoga teacher and a studio owner and a newspaper columnist and a nutrition coach, that you've had this full, amazing, wild ride. And you're just getting started, I think. <laughs> oh, <good grief. laughs> I both hope so and hope not. <laughs> Yeah, I'm ready for a little, maybe a little while with a little less adventure would be okay. good. Perhaps it's a different kind of adventure that yeah. would be more appropriate. Mm -hmm. Adjusting the adventure. All right. Okay, so um, let's dive right in. One of the topics that I mentioned, overcoming obstacles, is is important to, I think, all of us. It's imp It's been important for me in my life in some of the hurdles that I've experienced and, and had to overcome. But so many people seem to allow their past and even their current obstacles to get in the way of moving forward. And, you know, this is where I've, in my own life, unconsciously turned to different distractions or, you know, had these upper limits stop me. Um, and that happens a lot with my coaching clients as well when they're in the process of developing businesses. So how about we chat about some alternatives in dealing with obstacles in our businesses and in our lives. Okay. Alternatives. Yes. So as far this is such an exploratory space, Michael, you know? Yeah. Is that as far as like laying out what some of the answers are, um, that's a tough one. You know, I, I'm not sure I'm not in business and in this arena just for the sole purpose of being able to think and talk about this and watch different examples of it, having had to do a lot of overcoming obstacles and recreating a story for myself to be able to, like you said, um, change those upper limits, which for me, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a little background here in a second that you already mm -hmm. know, but your readers probably don't, but for your listeners, um, is we do, you know, there's so many psychological facets that go into the way we look to create stability in our lives. And the way we create stability in our lives is not always in healthy ways. Oftentimes it's by protecting the comfort zones that we've always known. And oftentimes those comfort zones are created uh, out of real and imagined limitations right? Stories that we believe about ourselves and things that we perceive other people believe about ourselves and stigma from whatever has happened. Um, and those places actually become quite comfortable. And because we have, you know, our higher selves and also more sort of lizard brains that crave habits because of a variety of reasons, including basic survival, we end up getting very comfortable in the known and become people that habituate wanting success or wanting to get to the next place instead of people who actually do. It becomes very, very comfortable to start telling the story that I'm going this direction, I'm doing things to get to this place, and yet the story always ends the same. I fall off the wagon, I screw up, I eat the whole bag of chips, I am not allowed to do that for X, Y, and Z. So the first, I'm on track, right, with your question? Yes, Maybe yeah, track. absolutely. So um, my personal story is, you know, I have many, actually. It's, you know, we could go on and on and I won't hijack. I won't hijack the value by just telling the stories, but it's valuable to use story as well. And so I have many, many stories. The one that I'm kind of known the best for that I talk about the most mostly because it makes such a great metaphor. I mean, it's really the most um, kind of dramatic thing that I have to use as a metaphor to talk about this particular stuff. So back in 1999, I was selling for a brief period of time, for about a year, I was carrying ecstasy tablets over state lines from New York City to Springfield, Missouri. A couple of years later, um, I got arrested. At that point, I had completely stopped, I had a baby. Um, I had started making some very different choices for my life. And um, 
anyway, and at long story short, I ended up spending two years in a federal prison. So when I got out of federal prison, um, having got, first of all, I was able, I guess, to be able, I, I had the chance to go into this place having developed a lot more skills and potentially being part of a, a crowd of people that are a little more of an outlying crowd for going into prison. I don't fit the average statistic, right? So, um, you know, I don't want to use the word lucky, but in many ways I was able to engage in this experience with probably a set of tools that was really unusual. I was also engaging the experience after a certain period of time had passed that I was able to um, be in a pretty high level place with sobriety and having a baby and all of these other things happen. So when I went in, there was some real clarity around being able to see the experience as being a metaphor. So mm. I got out and, you know, it was clear to me that there was, I needed to do something to mediate what was now a massive stigma and a massive limitation. I knew myself to have intelligence and talent and skills, and I knew I had something to offer, but what was available to me in the job market without, I have no traditional degree, now I had a felony. And by that point I was a single mother, um, and I got released to a small town in Missouri, very small town where my mother had retired released into her custody at 32 years old. Um, and so being faced with having lost everything, I had very few actual possessions at this point, no money, and all of these things working against me. Um, I really had to get into a space of how can I do it anyway? You know, with yeah, all these yeah. things, stacked against me and by do it at the time. And I think still what that means for me, you know, I am an entrepreneur. I have my own business. Um, you know, I am not the most wildly successful entrepreneur. I haven't just sold my app to Facebook. Basically I've built a pretty successful, thriving personal coaching practice and speaking practice and all the things. Yeah. And that's still growing. I'm very much still in the hustle of that. But what my original goal was, was that I would be self-sustaining, that I would be self-supporting, that I would never ever find myself in a kind of lifestyle where prison was any part of that reality again, and that I would never ever leave my family. Mm -hmm. That I would be able to have enough of an income to have a voice and to have a choice. And that happened, despite all of those odds. And so it has, I've, you know, needless to say, become deeply passionate and interested in what actually it takes for people to be able to do that. Because I'm surrounded by, we are all surrounded. It's very human to have a, have a deep existential need for that security. And then to use the available tools we have, which is very often our internal and external narratives to feel secure, even if that's in the spaces of things that aren't necessarily in the highest. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Am I, you know, I tend to get yeah. a little esoteric, but let me know if I'm not staying grounded and hopefully I answered your question. So, so as far as coming, you asked me for alternatives. And, you know, as far as, as giving you a list, it really is more of a conversation mm -hmm. than a list. And the recognition that it's and an understanding of what, what drives every human being. And that when we're talking to about it in these broader terms about people or whether we're talking about it to an individual person, individual people generally tend to think these are the places where they're weak or where they're broken. They're the tender places where they carry shame. So in a conversation with someone specifically, when I'm coaching someone, we're actually looking to tap into that and utilize some of that tenderness, build strength around it, and direct it in a way where they can actually be creating heart-centered connections with other people. 
and starting in a place where they're using those stories, either directly or indirectly, to practice in the world with the people that they trust. And then you can use those stories directly or indirectly. You don't have to tell everybody everything all the time. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're looking for here. But we're looking for a strong ability to tap into those places of vulnerability and use them to tap into other people's places of vulnerability to create deep connection. And when you're able to create those deep connection, you can engender compassion and support rather mm -hmm. than judgment and fear. And that's applicable to all the people that are human because everyone has that. Whether or not you have a story that's as dramatic as going to prison or as, you know, they're all, we all suffer. But some people say, I don't have a story or where do I start? Everyone has a place where they feel they're holding something. And yes. Generally, that's the place we can tap into you with that great power, open-hearted connection. This all is very complicated stuff to sort of talk about in generalized terms. And I would love to find a way. So if we tap into it in this conversation, that'd be rad. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's, it's, I mean, you're doing a brilliant job of describing something that, um, like you said, for whether it's in business or whether it's in life, it's it, to create a connecting point that's authentic and vulnerable with people. We've all had that experience where we've heard someone speak or we've seen them or we've even met them one-to-one -one, and they've shared something about themselves that we inherently know uh, was not, like it wasn't easy. It was a tough time, but they've shared that anyways. And if we've had a similar experience, you know, it, it can bring tears to our eyes or chills to, to our skin because that's this vulnerable, like, uh, just something about them that they've opened up to us that um, so many, it brings up so many emotions in us. Love, you know, fear, so many things. But it, it really connects, for me anyways, and, and probably for a lot of people, it connects, it's a powerful connection. And to be able right. to do that um, in a way that feels in a way that feels, I don't know if, it, if good is, good seems like a generic term, in a way that feels right in the context of your business or, or just your, your personal life is powerful. Um, I know I haven't fully embraced that. And it's, it's something that I honestly struggle with every day is connecting with people authentically in my business as, as an entrepreneur and a business person and in life as well. Um, it's it's easy and it's it's hard and it's simple. It's one of those things when we're talking about it in context of business. I think it's really valuable because we are more and more with the, the internet, with things like what we're doing right here, um, yeah. with the many many opportunities we have to connect with other people. The importance of making valuable and meaningful connections is greater than ever. And so, you know, to maximize the time we have, we're busier than ever. We have more and more people in front of us and spilling through our various feeds and passing us through the various network places. We have more opportunity to connect than ever. So creating meaningful connection is more valuable than ever. And I think that when you share something, and I want to be really clear here that that we can either be talking about directly sharing personal stories or when that's appropriate, and often it is. Because even when you're sharing a personal story that someone else hasn't gone through, which is also why this, this prison story has been applicable in conversations I'm having, because it's a great example how most people I talk to have not had that, that experience. But if we can be talking about the parts of an experience that encompass a more perennial human experience, or like you said, perennial human emotions, love, fear, desire, the ways that we seek stability and validation, and in the, in the process, 
make these insane mistakes sometimes. Everyone's done foolish things. Everyone has stumbled in the process of seeking love or acceptance in that way, um, in some way, right? Yeah. So when we can be having a conversation that's tapping into a more perennial existential space for every human being, then what's happening in that moment is that we're articulating an emotion for someone else. You know, it's that thing where you read a book, a really great book, and somebody says something and they're talking about a thing that happened to them and you're like, ah, I could have written that about my mother or about that one time with that person that I broke up with or that time I loved someone and they didn't love me back or that I made that horrible mistake and felt such shame out. And so when we're able to articulate our story, we both liberate the shame for ourselves. And when we share them, we give people the gift of language for their own feeling that then is able to liberate them. So it's, it's a, and so in, in, in sharing the stories, there's those options. Also, there's an opportunity when we're able to articulate things for ourselves and liberate the shame from them. We don't always have to tell the story specifically. But we, we open up access to that place inside ourselves that we can speak from. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And when we can connect on that level, we can sort of do the same thing on a more energetic space. And really, I think what it is, aside from just saying, I have this feeling, you have this feeling too, I think what happens on a more subtle level when we're legit connecting in a heart space. And like you said, you might just meet a person or you might hear someone speak. Um, I think it's a skill. There are actual things that I do and actual things that I teach people to do from physical practices and breathing exercises and ways that we take care of their body that can enhance this, that you can actually be intentionally finding that space. And what happens in that space is I think what I've come to through all, all this exploring, and I haven't still nailed it, is that what we're really looking for is a witness, for somebody to say, I see you, I hear you, you're here. There's, we're all here sort of fumbling mm -hmm. around. Who really knows why we're here and who we are? It's, yeah. it's the, any kind of stability we seek is kind of illusory anyway. So what all we have here, and we're getting closer and closer to a world that um, spends more time in meaningful connection. And we, we're in a world that's spending a lot more time seeking what that looks like as a community, what our family structures should be like. And ultimately, when we're able to be that person for someone, see you, I hear you, and we can share this space together, magic happens. And all of the, the language I'm using is a little bit woo, but it's completely applicable to business because a lot of times in business, especially for startups, for entrepreneurs, people are either isolated, they're working at home, they're on their computer all the time, they're completely isolated. Perhaps in social media, perhaps in their networking events, they're in a space where they think, I should be telling everyone what I do, handing out business cards, I should be talking to other people who do what I do. And I really believe in simply surrounding yourself with the most evolved and energetic and intelligent and hilarious people doing the most interesting things. It doesn't matter if they do anything like you do, but if you're in that environment and you're able to use the skills that we're talking about, that I love to teach and explore, is that you can get into those environments and you can make those kind of connections that happen on a level that you don't even have to hand out your business. Me and yeah. you, we're sitting here yeah. right now because we had a conversation about something that had nothing to do with what we're talking about now. We touched yeah. on this. Yes. You and me made a connection. You have introduced me to at least a dozen people who are now some of the coolest people I know. We've been able to connect in this way. We don't do anything that's, you know, we have very different lives. Yeah. This is a great example of why that works. We met at an event that had nothing to do with this. It was an event full of amazing people doing amazing things in a beautiful space, right? Yes. So that's what, <laughs> how it all comes 
back to work. Yeah. It's learning how to have the skill so that you can actually spend less time making way more meaningful connection. Okay. Yeah, as you're talking, it's it's sinking in um, for me a little bit here. Like what what meaningful connection, like the value of and the art of making meaningful connections. Because when you're able to do that on some level, um, there are so many other things that maybe we think we need to be doing or we're told to be doing that don't even matter. If we're making honest, meaningful connections with our clients, with our family, with our friends, with new friends, um, it just it, it's just such a clean and clear path to, I think, um, I don't want to say achieving, go- it's not about achieving goals, it's just about living more than anything. <laughs> more, living living a, an exciting and alive, you use some great terms, but living a life that feels rich and not worrying about so much about, you know, <laughs> getting, getting the word out on your, on your idea or whatever. If you're making those meaningful connections in a meaningful way, that stuff happens naturally in my experience. I've got a long ways to go in enhancing my ability to connect with people in a meaningful way, but it is one of my highest priorities as an entrepreneur, and it's one of the things that I value the most because I've seen results in it and because I truly... I, I truly enjoy it. I love I love connecting with someone on a level that's you know deeper than just your typical shallow conversation. I can't stand that actually. I cannot. I can barely stand a, 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 a just high level conversation. I'm not good at those. <laughs> I'm not either. <laughs> it feels like a waste of. I'd rather have one great conversation than a hundred boring conversations, even if those hundred conversations are with the hundred most successful people in the world. I'd rather have one yeah. great conversation and make a connection. Um, you know, it's a constant juggle when you're in business. because There are sort of these influencers and these people you feel like you should meet. And yeah. sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't. It's tough to find a life work balance, people say work-life balance, I call it a life-work balance. I came yeah. up with that with a friend of mine. Um, and you, we were taught, you mentioned that in the beginning, that that's one of the topics, it's, uh, creating a life that feeds your work. I think it's really important, especially as a startup or an entrepreneur, to be always looking for ways that you can achieve more with less effort because when it's your own and it's all on your shoulders, there is a constant feeling of never doing enough. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about making these connections with people, it's really like really trust and faith is a big part of this because it does feel like never doing enough. But when you follow some of these simple guidelines, when you continue to show up to the practice of, navigating whether this is a valuable meeting to take, whether that's a valuable networking event to go to, because a lot of this meaningful connection stuff is getting really good at saying no to the ones that don't feel right, even if that mm-hmm. person is somebody, whatever that is, right? Yeah. Um, spending a lot of time being selective about where you go and making sure you bring all of your good energy there and take excellent care of yourself and show up fully And then really take the time to integrate and deepen those connections, not spreading yourself too thin. Um, A work, you know, creating a life that feeds your work. So, for instance, the event that you and I met at that that wonderful book signing um, downtown space that your um, wife teaches yoga in. I mean, that was just great food, great company, wonderful humans. You know, that was priority on my list to go to and I didn't know why I was going um I knew on a gut level that I was showing up at a space that met all of this criteria that I was going to be able to go have some excellent conversations Mm -hmm. um okay and 
I had a good time. So when you're talking about creating a life, that's something I would have done socially. Yeah. Right. But as an entrepreneur, when, and as a single mom, you know, time is at a premium. Mm -hmm. And so doing things, I'll never do something that isn't fun, even for work. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I'm never going to talk to somebody that isn't going to be an excellent conversation that isn't going to feed my life. Even if I think it'll better my life. Does that make sense? It's not, I'm not going to go into a conversation thinking this person could yeah. propel my business. So I'm going to have an excruciatingly boring conversation with someone I don't respect because they might help my business. So creating a life that feeds your business can be anything from that, that extensive, like using these skills, with selective, with selectivity mm -hmm. to what you put on social media to create a personality for your business that people just want to be around. Yeah. Right. Yep. More ease, less effort. More ease, less effort. I'm all about that. So one of the, I mean, I could see this. I, I hear what you're talking about, and I believe in it 100%, Meg. Um, and I could see people, um, I could even see myself like making a judgment on, on, on this topic a little bit and saying, all right, so if, if you're, you're going to go into if a conversation with someone and it's not you you don't see this as meaningful then you're going to cut it short and you're going to move over to another conversation or it doesn't feel right or if there's an event that you know someone's invited you to and society would say or our culture would say you just need to show up and be there for them but it really is not enriching you feel that it's not going to enrich your life and you don't go you know, that's something that, that I honestly struggle with, you know, being invited to different things and just like, sometimes I go and then I get there and I'm like checked out. I'm like, why did I, why am I here? And the event that you're speaking of, um, it was serendipitous that I was there in the first place, but the moment that I was invited, I knew I had to be there. I didn't know why I didn't ask questions. I just knew that I needed to be there. Um, so that decision point of and, and having the clarity to to know like whether you should go to something or engage with someone or not and oftentimes the guilt that can kick in oh you should be there you should go anyway you should be there anyways like what do you what's what are your thoughts on that uh practice okay <laughs> <laughs> for sure like anything it is, it really comes down to practice. And I, I'm not sure, you know, personally, I feel like my clarity around that stuff definitely get, gets better all the time. I'm able to feel a lot less guilty all the time mm -hmm. um, because with practice, you get really clear on how detrimental it is when you're depleted. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, really important that not being depleted is the normal state of affairs. You can do the things you need to do to focus on what you're building. And that does mean saying no. And in many ways even, it means that the cooler your life gets, the cooler the things are that you have to say no to. And you can take yeah. that as a signifier of your success in a way. I read somewhere, it may have been some kind of Facebook meme or something, that said if it's not a hell yes, it's an F no. And that's yeah. kind of how to tell. And to, to practice listening to your gut, that if it doesn't feel like, hell yes, this is what I need to do, then I don't need to do it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like that. And that... I will, you know, with the disclaimer that sometimes you're going to end up at things that don't work. And sometimes yeah. you're going to miss really awesome things. That's, that's also going to happen. And yeah. I'm not sure that guilt is avoidable. Uh, I've come to the conclusion, and this sounds super simple, but it's one of the things that I end up talking about with clients a lot. We will never, no matter how successful we get financially or 
altruistically or whatever it is we're all trying to find or prove or any combination of those two things. And we're all trying to do some of that, whether we admit it to whatever degree or not. We all like to think we're totally looking to be in service in some way, and that's a lovely intention. But for every one of us, there's also something we're trying to escape or trying to prove or hoping to feel, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, we feel like on some level, and even I think we get told in so many ways that when we get there, we will be, we will have arrived at a place of happiness and, and um, satisfaction. And that somehow what's inherent in that place is that we'll no longer feel shame and discomfort and that nagging vulnerability that we're all looking to avoid. And vulnerability is actually, um, it's a hot word right now. And so when words get hot, it's difficult to fully understand them. And I think from, you know, just a shallow perspective of looking at that, it can be still this feeling of weakness. But I think, and it is inherently, but I like to, you know, talking about it in terms, it's important to remember that everything we're talking about is being able to hold this on a spectrum of, this is not full reveal. This is not skinless in the world. This is not naked. Just yes. if you're going to have an open heart, you have to have a strong spine. This yeah. is learning how to have that balance and it's practice. It's practice mm -hmm. and practice and practice of going into situations and saying no, even though it's uncomfortable, choosing to trust your gut, sitting through the guilt and reminding yourself that indeed staying home to write was more important than going out or that because you went out the previous night and you're exhausted, that nothing takes priority over a hot bath and a movie with the person that you're in love with or, you know, your blanket. That sometimes we have to have those things to carry on and that refueling is one of the most important things we need to do and that there will always be another chance. Um, so it's practice and it's support. It's having conversations like these. It's hiring people like you and I. It's hiring your housekeeper if you need someone to come in and take some of the load off. It's imperative to have a system of support to do that witnessing that I was talking about a little while ago. When you're in the world struggling with this, especially as a business owner, starting a startup at any phase, Anybody, even when you're having a job that you don't like or do like, being a human being in the world requires, on every level, just like a baby that doesn't get held will die, we mm -hmm. still carry that primal need. And there's a way we feel deeply held when we're yeah. with it. When we yes. have a system of support, whether family or a combination of family and people we pay, our coaches, our therapists, our yoga teachers, our housekeepers, the people that come in and just take a little bit of that load off and say, it's okay. You're right where you need to be. I see you. Does hey, I hope you were taking some good notes on this amazing discussion with Meg. I know I was. I just loved it when Meg stated that she would rather have one deep and meaningful conversation instead of 100 boring conversations, even if it was with 100 of the most successful people in the world. I don't know how many times that I've had conversations with people just because I felt like it was the right thing to do or the thing that I had to do. Today, one of the things that I work the hardest on is making meaningful connections with people, and it's just one of the most rewarding things that I do by far, making those heartfelt connections with people who are energetic and fun and interesting is hands down the best thing that I've done for my business and my life. There's just nothing that can substitute for great people in your life. It enriches every aspect of all that I do. So be sure to join me next week as Meg and I continue with the conversation of making those meaningful connections, and we go even deeper into that whole process. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Hey, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to head on over to thestartupsessions.com for a full recap of all our episodes, including links to amazing resources for each guest, thoughtful and provoking blog articles, and many other great resources. Thank you so much for listening and watching. And if today's guest can create a meaningful business and achieve a life of freedom through a business with soul, why can't you?